The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Cancer Screening and Preventive Care for Transgender Individuals, Patient and Provider Perspectives on Best Practices and Special Considerations, featuring Dr. Elizabeth Eman from Oodle Family Medicine in Renton, Washington, Dr. Don S. Dizon from Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, Dr. Diane Brousseau from the Yale School of Medicine PA Online Program and Healthy Transitions, LLC, in Montclair, New Jersey, and Taylor Chandler Walker, BCTCT. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash YDT860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Thank you for attending our discussion today. Uh, the topic of today is going to be cancer screening, screening and preventative care for transgender and gender diverse individuals. Um, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, I'll start with myself. Uh, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Eman. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a family physician in the Seattle area. Uh, and Dr. Dizan, would you like to introduce yourself? Happy to, and I'm really happy to be a part of this panel. Uh, my name is Don Dizon. I go by he, him, his. I'm a professor of medicine and professor of surgery at Brown University and am a medical oncologist uh, with a specialty in breast and pelvic cancers. Diane? Hi, I'm Diane Brousseau. I'm a PA. I'm a clinician educator. So I'm a faculty assistant professor at the Yale School of Medicine in the PA online program, as well as a clinician at Healthy Transitions. Yes. And Taylor? Hello, I'm Taylor Chandler Walker. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am a published author and national speaker on intersex and transgender rights. I'm also a board certified transgender care therapist, but I don't see patients. I mainly do mental health assessments for homeless or at-risk youth coming into workforce development programs so that we have a good picture of everything that's going on. Thank you. So the first thing that I want to get into is to make sure, now I, I, would, I would hope that most of our participants today have a basic knowledge of gender diversity, um, but I want us all on the same page. So we're going to do a brief overview of the core principles in the clinical manage management of uh, trans, non-binary, and gender diverse individuals. And I'd like to have Diane kind of tell us a little more about that. Happy to. So like I mentioned, my name is Diane. My pronouns are she, her. I live in New York City. I'm specifically in Queens. And I mention that because where I live, there are over 800 languages spoken here. So we are the capital of linguistic diversity of the human species. We hold the Guinness World Record. This is very important to me. Language is very important to me. So I want to make sure that we are all on the same page with the foundational science-based language because also the way that we use a term uh, in a science, as a scientific construct may not be the way the term is used in popular culture. So on the slide in front of you, you'll see DSAB and ASAB, designated or assigned sex at birth. You know, after delivery, we don't run DNA in all babies. We just look between their legs and assign a sex based on phenotype. And in the U.S., babies are assigned either female or male, regardless of genotype, regardless of differences of sexual development. But in other countries, uh, there's an opportunity maybe to use a, a letter other than an M or an F. Uh, so, so we are. This is kind of what we are working with here in the U.S. Now, gender identity would be your innate, your internal sense. Of your gender. While your gender expression is a social and external way uh, to communicate gender, but I want you to keep in mind, just because someone performs a particular gender in a certain way, uh, it doesn't mean that that performance represents their gender identity. And this is especially true in environments that are restrictive, like here in the U.S. Transgender refers to a discordance between the gender identity and the DSAB or ASAB, the assigned sex at birth where cisgender means concordance. What this has nothing to do with is sexuality, sexual orientation, uh, sexual attraction, behavior identity. Trans and cis people can be of any sexuality. Uh, Don, do you want to dovetail on this? Sure, absolutely. And I think um, 
for a lot of us who don't have the experience or have not had the exposure to dealing with sexual orientation and gender diverse populations, the gender bred person is a really nice way to sort of expand on exactly what Diane was talking about. Because the National Academies for Science, Engineering and Medicine just came out with a report about sexual orientation, gender identity, and how these words are not synonymous. So in this figure is what's called the gender bred person. And the main take home point is exactly what Diane is saying in a more, um, I would say more modern way, that gender is not the same thing as sexual orientation and is not the same thing as biologically determined sex. Gender, you can think about, is a social construct. Sex is based on biological traits. In a lot of us, they're congruent. In, a, a, in many people, they are not congruent. So we are not all born 100% male, 100% female. We may, may be 100% clear on what our sexual orientation is, what our gender identity is. But as clear as I am that I am a male person, and as clear as I am that I am attracted to men, it is not necessarily the same for everybody. So let me let me build on that uh, a little bit as well. In the last decade, another important shift has happened for gender diverse folks, and that's the move away from looking at gender diversity as a psychopathology to looking at gender diversity as a difference. Um, there was a historic move to reduce stigma. This is about 2013. And the American Psychiatric Association took gender dysphoria out of the section of the DSM uh, on mental health, but they kept it in the DSM more, more generally um, to ensure that there was access to care. And I just want to share a quote from them where they said, the APA said, it's important to note that gender nonconformity is not in itself a mental disorder. I wanted to make sure I said that explicitly in this room. Um, yeah. they've, they've stated that gender diversity is common it's culturally diverse. It exists across all cultures. It's a variation like being gay or being left-handed and that it is not inherently pathological or negative. And that's something that the World Professional Association for Transgender Health has been saying for a long time. In 2019, the World Health Organization agreed with them and they then shifted to the term gender incongruence, again, to depathologize the language. Um, so now the ICD-11 um, has gender incongruence and they've also removed that from the mental health section as well. There are an estimated 25 million gender diverse people worldwide. There's about 1.4 million trans adults in the US and about 150,000 adolescents. Um, on the slide, you can see the data from DC and North Dakota. And I was intentional about that because they have the greatest and the least percent of the trans population. I wanna highlight the 3.14% of 18 to 24 year olds in DC. First of all, this is a gross underestimation. And that's because the form that's taken by sex and gender is entirely dependent on whether the environment is permissive or restrictive and the US is a restrictive environment. Now there was a survey in New Zealand, it was about 8,500 uh, secondary school kids uh, and 4% identified with a gender other than their assigned sex at birth. And the difference is that the environment there is you know, somewhat more permissive, not completely, but, but somewhat more. Um, and I also want to highlight this trend line. So if you look at the 18 to 24 year olds as having the largest percentage of uh, gender diverse folks compared to our over 65, and this trend line shows up in other polls as well. Now there's a, there's a survey that I want to bring up, a study from 2016 with an N of 27,000, over 27,000 trans adults from across the US. And that number itself is incredibly remarkable if you consider that there's about 1.4 million trans adults. So that means 20% took this survey. Um, and while most individuals identify in the binary, male and female, boy or girl, man or woman, um, it's really important to note that some individuals' identities might be in between or outside these categories. So in this survey, 31% of trans adults identified as non-binary. And non-binary genders, it's not an American invention. This isn't just happening in our society. In fact, we're pretty late to the table. There's many other countries from Canada to Netherlands to Taiwan 
They'll all allow non-binary gender recognition on identity documents. And I mention this because you may see someone in your practice whose identity uh, documents have a gender marker of something other than an M or an F. You might see a T, an E, an I, an X, an O, or even a blank. Um, there, there was in the same study, in this James and all study, there was also a question that was asked uh, whether folks were okay with being identified and referred to as being transgender. And while about 86% were okay with it, there's a large portion that were not. So uh, I want to sit, propose to you another way of speaking about your uh, transgender patients other than just saying this is a transgender woman, transgender male, a non-binary patient. Um, and again, like I said, because language is important to me. Um, what your patient hears you say, what they read in your documentation can really affect your gender diverse patient's psychological well-being in a significant way. So here are some alternatives that you can be that you can use in charting and case presentations and how you talk about this patient population. Instead of saying, you know, Renee is a 12-year-old transgender female, you could say Renee is a 12-year-old female assigned male at birth or AMAB. Uh, and that's exactly what you would write in the chart. Uh, instead of saying Robert's a 12-year-old transgender male, you would say, you know, Robert's a 12-year-old male at, or AFAB and AFAB. And it's, it works with non-binary as well. So you could say, Robert's a 12-year-old non-binary patient assigned female at birth. So essentially what you're doing is you're providing the gender identity first and followed by the assigned sex at birth. Um, just like race and ethnicity, gender identity is not something we can ascertain just by looking at someone. It has to be asked. Um, and this follows the best practice of asking two questions, gender identity and assigned sex at birth. It can be done during patient intake. Uh, and it does tie into the EMR, Electronic Medical Records, Meaningful Use Criteria. Now, when the CDC moved to asking these two questions, asking, uh, they used to ask if gender was male, female, or transgender, which is better than nothing. But when they moved to the two-question method, they had a 64% increase in the number of trans individuals who are identified. And this is really important because there's a good chance there's a portion of your patients who are going to try to be stealth, meaning they're not going to bring it up. They're not going to talk about it. So by collecting the data on gender identity and assigned sex at birth, it presents an opportunity for disclosure. It sends a message that you want your transgender patients to be seen. Now, there's two other groups that are, that are uh, asking these questions. The first one is Press Ganey. That's the company. They measure patient satisfaction, and they've integrated gender identity into their measures. They have a, a dozen other questions based on how the patient responds to this one. So the, so the press Ganey will ask, how well does staff respect your needs based on your gender identity? And if the patient responds to that question, then it, it diverts them to about a dozen questions. It's now being tracked whether your trans patient's satisfaction scores are disparate or not. Uh, as of 2022, gender identity is now included in the CMS it's called the Merit-Based Incentive pay, uh, Payment System, the MIPS criteria, which means that patient satisfaction, health outcomes of your trans patients, these are all being tracked now. In other words, there are financial incentives tied to your trans patients' experiences, satisfaction, and outcomes. And the, the last slide I have for you guys on language is just this. Um, creating a welcoming environment is essential. Sometimes you can speak to it. Sometimes you will have to rely on, you'll, you'll want to rely on symbolism. A few ways that you can do that would be to maybe have a lapel pin that has the transgender pride flags on it. You could have something on your ID uh, lanyard that uh, speaks to pronouns. Some colleagues have added pronouns to their white coats or to their scrubs. Some symbol that says to your patients that you are creating a safe and brave space. And I would love to ask Taylor if you would uh, speak to what this would mean to you and your experiences. This is absolutely amazing, and I'm so glad we're having this conversation. Um, you know, a welcoming environment when you're dealing with medical professionals is of the utmost importance because nobody typically likes going to the doctor. And when we're dealing with cancer, we're dealing with preventative care, not going when we're sick necessarily. And so creating this environment is everything. Speaking from experience, I wasn't always honest with doctors just because I didn't want to deal with all of the gender issues. And so that has issues on both sides. It makes it so you can't do your job and treat me. And 
I'm not being honest, so I'm not receiving treatment that I might need. Um, in addition, I strongly recommend um, gender neutral bathrooms. Nothing speaks louder than that. And your collateral around your office. Have people that look like people that are going to be coming into the office. Um, and, you know, it's okay when you come in, say, Hi, I'm Taylor. Um, she, her, hers, and it sets a tone. Be careful about asking someone their pronouns that you're not implying that something is, you know, not necessarily congruent per se. Um, and I absolutely love the acronyms for assigned male at birth and different things like that because so often it is triggering when we see like a doctor's folder, their laptops open, and it says biological male or biological female. That's really triggering. There is a time in every trans person's life where they still have their assigned sex at birth and their dead name on their identity documents and their other paperwork. And if you're lucky, hopefully there's a friend or a family member who's gonna to try to get your attention to let you know this before you work in the, walk into the exam room. But it's, it's not always there. Uh, it's, it's not always that person there for them. But there is a place in the EMRs that have met meaningful use criteria, there is a place for preferred name and there is a place for this information around gender identity, assigned sex at birth. But we as clinicians don't tend to go to that information because it's all the way over in the admin section of the chart. It's the demographic section. It's not an area where we never regularly look. But when you see a trans patient in your practice, the most important thing you can do to start off with is to get that patient's chosen name and pronouns right. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, when it, when it comes to things like prevention and, and health disparities, what, what the main issues are, it's not necessarily, you know, health disparities caused by biological predilection to certain diseases, but it's really minority stress lack of access and lack of trust in the healthcare system that causes these disparities uh, in, in most minority communities. Um, it's such a common thread with marginalized individuals. So having that kind of welcoming environment and just really thinking about all of your patients, including your gender diverse patients, um, every day when you go into work would be a huge, you make a huge impact. Taylor, did, did you wanna talk a little bit about um, some data we have about how people have felt in healthcare systems and how trans people have been surveyed about their, their response there. Did you want to add to that? Sure. Um, you know, this survey needs to happen way more often. Um, almost as soon as it was done, it was outdated. And, you know, Unfortunately, in my experience, the patients that benefit the most from this information and data being used to create funding for programming um, were, didn't do it. Um, I live in DC and you know, we are 49% black um, as the District of Columbia, but whether it's COVID, whether it's cancer prevention, whether it's gender affirming care, being black, you're, you're faced with health inequities that are, you know, to me, it seems just unnecessary, but they exist. And, you know, patients that really need this care, this preventative care need to trust a doctor don't have that relationship. And, you know, this leads to a million things like, you know, why are they not on prep? Why are, you know, why is the uptick of HIV in black women that are cis het? You know, it's because we don't have real conversations about gender and gender expanse, you know, and there is a trust issue, you know, too many things have happened to people of color throughout history when it comes to medical care that they don't want to go to the doctor when they're sick, let alone preventative. And we're seeing the same data in our transgender and gender diverse patients, where like a third of people who saw healthcare providers in the past year, according to one survey, had a negative experience, which can include things like 
complete denial of care or even abuse uh, from their healthcare providers. Um, the numbers are, are pretty depressing. The thing that happens the most is misgendering. Doctors will use pronouns that are based on the assigned sex at birth. You know, we get into debates all the time about assigned sex. People, lay public, doesn't believe that. They believe that it's not assigned by a doctor, but it very much is. And trying to convince the general public of that is difficult. And I love what Dr. Dizam was talking about because biological sex can be, you know, genetic, it can be hormonal, and it can be um, chromosomal. And they don't always add up. Yeah, I'm just going to raise my hand. So I, <laughs> I think Diane, you know, really uh, emphasized something really important as well in all of this is that we are just learning how to ask people these questions. Um, you know, one question doesn't work as well as two questions, but in this whole conversation, and it came up in another presentation I did, we we're just learning how to incorporate intersex people in these conversations. My God, they were assigned a, gender, a sex at birth, even though it wasn't entirely clear looking at them what sex they were. And this is still that population that are not binary, in which case the gender bread man doesn't even take into account that population, but we have yet to embrace them as truly intersex and we have so much work to do. So we have to get to the point where we are using this terminology clearly because biology and nature has proven that we are assigning a sex at birth by the mere nature that there's this natural occurrence of a people that count. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think kind of in summary for the kind of overview of trans care, I mean, I think you know, we, we want to make sure we have our bases covered in terms of making sure we have a welcoming environment, a place where uh, people who are non-binary, gender diverse, or trans feel comfortable, where they can, you know, use the restroom safely. Uh, we want to make sure that the people in the, the office or in the hospital, the residents, the nurses, um, the dining staff uh, understand um, how to interact with patients who are gender diverse. We need people in leadership to be on board. Uh, and we need to also make sure that we're keeping abreast with what's going on in the gender diverse community. And as things grow and change that we're keeping up uh, in our practices and in our hospital and healthcare systems. Um, anything else to add before we move on to preventative screening? The one thing I would add to this whole conversation, and again, I think both of you just brought it up, when we talk about, you know, in engaging and welcoming um, transgender people, we do have to talk about implementation. It's not just the docs that do this. Taylor, you might even, you know, talk about, you know, you have to, people have had to brace themselves for being unwelcomed from the moment they step into a healthcare clinic, looking around the walls, looking at the bathrooms, approaching a front desk and seeing that gender, you know, dis, dis, you know, incongruence where the chart says male, but clearly I'm looking at a female and just you read people. So really the education has to be beyond just those of us who are treating. There has to be everyone that greets that person from the start. And I would just add one, one thing to that, which is until you know that your patients uh, chosen name and, and their pronouns, gender neutral language is a great interim solution before your patient discloses. You might replace husband and wife with spouse. You might refer, refer to body parts like penis and vagina with genitals, sometimes over the chest. So, so we have the language to do this if we, if we just take a little energy to, to do it. Correct. Correct. Um, and, you know, mother and father with parent and so forth. So um, those are really good points. Um, we're going to talk now a little bit about the preventative care and, and um, cancer screening recommendations or, you know, talking about preventing disease in transgender and gender diverse individuals. Now, when we talk about preventative care, there's, there's different kind of aspects of it. So we're not going to be diving into preventing 
things like heart disease or diabetes or screening for depression. Those things are all very important um, and very important to make sure we're doing for all of our patients, including our trans and, and non-binary and gender diverse, diverse patients. But we'll be really focusing on cancer screening. And when we talk about cancer screening, it's kind of broken down into, um, uh, I, you know, there's lumpers and splitters. I'm kind of a lumper. Uh, it, it's kind of broken down into early detection and prevention. So, you know, we have our modes of early detection, like breast cancer screening, where we can find, you know, something early, hopefully, and intervene before we uh, see any significant disease burden. And then we have our prevention, which is where we can find maybe some um, early, you know, precancerous lesions that we can take care of before they turn into something like in, you know, uh, colonic polyps or in pap smears. And even better, we can vaccinate against viral mediated dysplasia, which can then lead to cancer. So I think uh, it's important um, to just, you know, make sure that we're talking about cancer screening and, and uh, kind of in the right way. We'll be talking about um, our trans and gender, you know, expansive patients. So we're probably today, we're really going to focus more on reproductive cancers. So we're gonna be focusing on cancers of breast tissue and of genital tissue and prostate and so forth. So those are the ones that are specifically uh, relevant to our certain population. Yeah, um, and obviously colon cancer as well. Um, we're gonna be um, getting into that in a little more detail. Um, Diane, what, did you wanna add anything? I think it's interesting when you consider your, your trans patients uh, looking at the screen in front of us, um, I wonder, you know, when, here, here are these recommendations for when to start breast cancer screening or when to start some of the others. And I wonder how other folks in the room, when they start their breast cancer screenings on someone who's trans, trans feminine, whether they're non-binary or female identified, um, who's been on hormones, do you wait for them to be on hormones right. for five years or 10 years or what, what do you do? So, so for me, I actually do age-based uh, cancer screening. So um, if they've been on cross-sex hormones, my trans feminine patients, for example, with breast development, if they've been on cross-sex hormones since adolescence, um, we'll, we'll discuss, you know, risk, various risk factors, obviously, to see if we want to start at 40. Otherwise, we would start at 50. And for my patients who start, you know, who started um, estradiol at, at a later at a later date and had breast development, um, perhaps like in their 30s and 40s, we can usually wait till 50 to start our screening. Um, that's based on the USPSTF organ-based guidelines. Um, and that's my, that's my personal practice. Um, the guidelines that we're looking at right now is actually the American Cancer Society and not the USPSTF, which is really what primary care bases most of their recommendations on, um, the United States Preventative Service Task Force guidelines. Um, these are kind of broader guidelines, but they include things like pap smears, um, you know, we do HPV co-testing with pap smears in our patients over 30, uh, which can expand testing intervals. Uh, there's, there's different aspects of, of testing for different body parts based on the recommendation committees. Um, but, but yeah, I think, I think, and so for my trans masculine patients who still have a cervix, I will treat them by the organ-based guidelines from the USPSDF. I feel like those are still kind of the some of the better guidelines out there. Yeah, Diane. And I've got one more follow-up question for you, which is this. So um, in your trans feminine patients who've had a vaginoplasty, right? So we, there's no cervix, it's a blind cuff. So in that case, they're often the vaginoplasty uses a graft of either um, a, what's called a penile inversion, or it yeah. uses a part of sigmoid colon, uh, or it can be uh, the peritoneum, and sometimes it's graftless. Um, so in that case, are we, how do you how do you navigate the screenings in in, in those uh, in patients post vaginoplasty? Yeah, so when we talk about cancer screening, we also talk a lot about anatomy, and I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later and talk about it specifically what kind of anatomy our patients might or might not have, um, what kind of vaginoplasty, blind pouch, did they have a pull through, you know, what kind of tissue are we going to be screening? I think that's that's important, and that's a very individual based question. Um, and that's why it's important to screen anatomy and not treat everybody, you know, based on their gender presentation. There's no specific USPSTF guidelines on um, cancer screening um, for transgender individuals, but there's some guidelines that have been published and, and 
some kind of trends we've seen uh, in recent research um, that I was going to ask Dr. Dizan to talk a little bit more about. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the major take home point for me has always been the idea of the, the anatomy inventory to guide screening. And I think we will be talking about that a little bit later, but, you know, certainly gender appearance should not be the way we do screening. Why we screen is because we want to influence cancer related mortality. We want people to survive. And the best way is not to have people diagnosed with cancer. That's the, that's the, really the goal for cancer prevention. Uh, Dr. Eman, you mentioned wonderful uh, examples of this with the pap smear for sure and polyps with colonoscopy. This is what we're looking at if you look at mortality trends among uh, people who are transgender um, and receiving hormone therapy. This is the Amsterdam cohort. It's one of actually the largest cohorts in the world that have been following uh, patient, following people who are transgender. And what you're seeing in the, in the uh, columns is overall mortality. And then the second box is about cancer-related mortality. And they're focusing on lung. They're focusing on digestive tract cancers. And then there's this group of other. The big take-home point, I think, for me is that if you look at transgender women and you compare them to either general populations of men or general populations of women, you're seeing a significant mortality increase among transgender women when it comes to all cancers, when it comes to lung cancer, but not so much when you look at GI tract or other types of cancers. And that same phenomenon isn't there for trans men. All of these confidence, confidence intervals in the right side on transgender men compared to uh, general populations of women or men, they all cross one. So there's not the significant mortality risk. I think the real take home point as well, because we're talking about a population who may be taking gender affirming hormone therapy with all the supposed risks that we're going to give uh, them higher rates of hormone driven malignancies. We are actually not seeing that. Right. We are not seeing higher rates of reproductive cancers, even in the context of gender affirming hormone therapy. That should provide us reassurance that right. people who want to be themselves as they see themselves are also not harming themselves. And that's a very important point. We're not making people sicker by con by confirming their gender identity with hormone treatment. Um, I also want to point out real quickly about that study. Um, it's an Amsterdam study, so they do have access to um, healthcare um, universally. And so cost of things like colonoscopy screening um, and a physical exam and those kind of things don't really play as much of a part um, in these studies as it does in the U.S. So the numbers might be different in the U.S., um, when we're looking at cost and access um, and you know the the ability to find and afford uh, appropriate screening. so right. And Dr. Ian, Ian Taylor, you mentioned it in earlier conversations as well. The intersectionality of the transgender community is also not going to be reflected in the Amsterdam cohort. This is a typically homogeneous race cohort of white Europeans, right, who have universal health care. Yeah, with universal health, this is not reflective of the trans community in the United States. So even though we put these up here as markers, we need to understand that the research is not complete and by no means do we have any conclusive answers. But as a, an oncologist, I can squarely look at someone who is trans and coming me to for their breast cancer. And I do this with women in general who say, have taken hormones to have children, you are not to blame for your breast cancer. Right. Yeah. And in fact, if we look at this slide of breast, breast cancer in transgender individuals, it's a little complicated and there is no top line conclusion. And one of the things I've always talked about, and I'd love to hear all of your viewpoints on this, when you speak on breast cancer, the question to me is whether transgender people have a higher or a lower risk depends on what group you're comparing them to. If you're taking transgender women and you're comparing them to cis men, 
it's almost intuitive that their risk is going to be higher because they're taking gender affirming hormone therapy to grow breast tissue. We know if you have breast tissue, you're going to be at an increased risk of breast cancer. Even if you're a cis man and you have breast tissue called gynecomastia, that increases your risk. But if you look at comparing women to women, transgender women to cis women, as pointed out in that, that fourth bullet, the risk is lower than in cisgendered women. So again, not a tie-in. Gender affirming hormone therapy and breast cancer, not a clear tie that this is cause and effect or associated. I know Diane or Taylor, do you have any comments, Dr. Eman? Um, I, I mean, I think the take home is we're not causing harm by confirming right. gender. And I think a lot of people are afraid um, in primary care, especially to um, when they see a patient who wants to start hormone therapy to confirm their gender, um, gender identity, uh, are afraid that they're going to be causing disease and harm. Um, and yeah. that's just, that's, it's the opposite of true. We're actually reducing harm and reducing dysphoria and other disease burdens by, by uh, confirming gender with medical treatment. Diane. And just a quick dovetail from the last slide. There, there's one other point from that same, <clears throat> excuse me, from that same study, that um, you know, trans masculine folks are um, getting screened. The the screenings that need to happen are happening at lower at lower rates than we right. would anticipate. So I just wanted Correct. to bring that into it because that's going to add in as well to the outcomes. Absolutely. Yep. So if we go to this next slide, Dr. Eamon, maybe you want to lead off this this conversation. Yeah, I well, I, I wanted to bring up that, you know, we, were, we said earlier, right, there's no real kind of well-validated and established overall screening guidelines when it comes to the specific transgender population. Um, however, just recently, uh, the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology released um, some guidelines for screening transgender patients with BRCA. Um, and that's, it's kind of exciting since we're, we're, we're actually looking at this, this patient population here um, in regards to an increased risk of, of breast and reproductive cancers. Um, Dr. Dizon, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, you know, I think this is an area where it's not being driven by data. It's really driven by clinical opinions. And if you look at what the table actually says, it's really follow what we recommend a la the National Comprehensive Cancer Center Network guidelines on uh, evaluating people who have these mutations which predispose them to breast, ovary, and prostate cancers, which is very relevant to the trans community right. because screening, like Diane mentioned, is not happening. You wonder about access to prophylactic surgical approaches. In my mind, if someone is trans, male and has a BRCA mutation, it is more of a reason to push for an oophorectomy because that risk of ovarian cancer is higher. And it's still, I don't know if it's the same, Taylor, maybe you can answer that question for me. You know, for trans men with a uterus and an ovaries, mastectomies are covered. And Dr. Eamon, you might know, they, we can do a mastectomy to gender uh, reassign, but still it's not typically covered, at least it wasn't 10 years ago, to remove the uterus and the ovaries for a trans man. So it's more and more it is covered. Um, we'll, we'll get into this a little bit more when we talk about anatomy, but um, oftentimes there needs to be a reason like vaginal bleeding or that kind of thing. But um, I know like in my state of, of Washington, it's actually Medicaid is required to cover transgender support services. So, um, med, you know, surgery, medication, all of that is, is required to be covered by Medicaid as of January of this year. In, in New York, is in New York as well, and you know when the yeah. Affordable Care Act came out, they did include um, a section that uh, required there to be non-discrimination on the basis of gender identity. But I believe part of that got rolled back, unfortunately. So, so we we have a patchwork uh, depending on what state you're in. And then the other thing is, you know, we're talking about um, somebody with BRCA who is uh, transgender, um, you know, transmasculine who it might have uh, hysterectomy and bilateral oophorectomy and you know total radical, you know, no cervix. But when we talk about chest reconstruction, usually they do like to leave some breast tissue for you know sculpting of the chest. And so we need yeah. to discuss that issue. Um, yeah, yeah. So 
So we'll talk about that a little more when we talk about anatomy, um, especially, you know, we've mentioned prostate cancer screening um, in patients with vaginoplasty. That's something that we're going to we're going to make sure we don't forget about mentioning as well. Yeah. Um, so um, any other discussions about gynecologic cancers that we didn't talk about or any concerns? No, it's just, just for this for this group to know the first um, experience I had, which actually drew me to this topic was one of my very first patients was a trans male with ovarian cancer. Um, and, you know, these questions, which arose 10 years ago, we are still asking today, what was the role of testosterone in bringing on this breast cancer, telling him it wasn't your fault that, that this happened to you. But even the more complicated thing, which is really, it, it's beyond the purview, but again, it's something for any oncology specific providers to think about, is how you counsel people post a cancer diagnosis about resuming gender affirming hormone therapy, exceptionally complicated. There's no right or wrong, but the patient needs to be drawn into that conversation 100%. Yeah. And that's for, that's... for any oncologist or folks with, with additional interest in this topic, I would refer them to a movie that was called Southern Comfort of a <laughs> transmasculine person from the South, right? Uh, tried to get a hysterectomy, had, had gynecological cancer, saw over 30 providers who declined to care for him and, and died from it. So, you know, that it wasn't that long ago, unfortunately. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so we're going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about HIV. So, um, as health providers, um, engaged in this, in this discussion today, um, the participants here and, and those of us on the panel, um, we're pretty familiar with the risks of, of HIV, um, especially uh, HIV that's untreated and AIDS, um, the increased risk of certain cancers and some that are even virally mediated. Um, the reason we're bringing this up is um, because there are some um, increased cases of HIV in certain subsets of the trans and gender diverse population. And this is something to make sure that we, we don't skip over. Um, so um, I know Diane wanted to talk a little bit about this. Um, Diane? Happy to do it. So, you know, while, you know, HIV uh, prevention technologies like PrEP are very effective, we don't have a vaccine, um, but it does have an impact on on the cancer your patients, uh, HIV positive cancer patients outcomes. Um, you know, trans adults are living with HIV at five times greater rates than cis adults, uh, with the highest rates among women and non-binary folks who are designated male at birth, uh, and the highest among black women and uh, black trans femmes who are designated male at birth at, at about 19%. Uh, um, and there's quite a few known barriers to HIV prevention in the trans community, one of them relating directly to hormone therapy, which is uh, there's the misperception that, uh, that PrEP, uh, you know, the prevention technology for PrEP uh, will lower your estradiol levels when in fact the data actually shows that feminizing hormone therapy with estradiol actually lowers serum concentrations of your daily oral PrEP to the equivalent of taking about four pills a week, right? So. Uh, there's also another another challenge that the community faces what, among the male and non-binary folks who are designated female at birth, um, who are having receptive front hole vaginal sex, which actually requires 21 days of PrEP for effic efficacy. Um, but often they may get misinformation if they're getting their care from a gay men's health network. Um, they may be told that only seven days is required because of the penetration in the anal tissue. Um, so there's the there's a, uh, another disparity uh, there. But ultimately, you know, while these HIV pre prevention uh, technologies are effective. You know, we don't have a vaccine, but with something like HPV, which also contributes to many cancers, you know, we do. So I feel like there's a, a correlation between the HIV and HPV that's kind of worth right. talking about here. Right. So we were bringing up HIV mostly because we also want to talk about HPV. That's right. 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 Taylor, did you have any comments about HIV in the trans community before, or Dr. Dizan, before we move on to the... Yeah. Um, I'd like to, to make people aware that the reason that number is so high amongst black trans women is because of the barriers to um, sustainable work. So oftentimes they're engaged in survival sex work. It is work. People don't tend to think of it that way, but it puts them in vulnerable situations. Um, here in DC, 
I actually know trans women that got HIV on purpose to get housing, to get um, resources, to get medical care. And that just absolutely breaks my heart that we are at this pivot where that has to happen. And then because they're normally U equals U, but if not, and they, you know, transfer HIV, there's no conversation for black men typically to have a conversation about being attracted to women of trans experience. So then they pass on HIV to their partner, their wife. Um, it, these are conversations that really need to be had to change that dynamic. We could have a whole nother talk on HIV yeah. in, the, in the black and trans population, especially. Um, I think mostly we're, we're um, talking about how HIV increases the risk um, of certain types of you know, virally mediated cancers. Uh, we, but we can you know, prevent HIV as well uh, with PrEP. So that's a really important conversation that we had. Um, I, I'd, like, I'd like Dr. Dizon to talk a little bit about some HPV-mediated HPV cancer that's kind of on the rise. Um, right, and I, you know, it's an interesting conversation going uh, from what Taylor, you just talked about to thinking about anal cancer. If I look back at the last two years, the anal cancers I've seen have been in cis men and cis women, but they all walk away with the same stigma that everyone's gonna think they're gay, they're HIV positive, or that they had sex with a trans person. The stigma goes both ways and it's fascinating, but we cannot escape the facts when it comes to anal cancer, which are exactly listed here. HIV, HPV, human papillomavirus, HIV, co-infections exist and they are very common in the HIV infected population that will increase the risk of anal cancer but anal cancer is not a gay disease it is a disease that's associated with um, tobacco multiple sexual partners and receptive intercourse it is not synonymous with orientation and it is not synonymous with gender it is synonymous with HPV infection the vast majority are HPV mediated or associated. And what's striking, just like Dr. Eamon said, it is rising about 2% per, uh, per year, highest in those who are HIV positive and relevant in this conversation because the prevalence also includes transgender women. So the take home would be we need to think about anal pap smears and screening for HPV mediated, you know, dysplasia in certain patients who have certain sexual activities and meet Correct. certain criteria. Um, so HIV and receptive anal intercourse being two very big ones. Um, so when, you know, when we're talking about screening and prevention and we can prevent anal cancer if we can catch the dysplasia early. So that's another place we can, we can do better. And we right. can do better on, excuse me, <clears throat> and we can do better even further with the HPV vaccination, right? So this yes. quote is actually from a November 2021 publication where um, HPV burden inequities were identified in sexual and gender minority folks. And we can summarize this just by saying that we are failing to vaccinate our transgender patients. Uh, there's reduced vaccination rates in these cohorts. Um, there also exists a lack of HIV vaccine and cancer screening recommendations specifically for trans adults. Um, research on cancer prevalence in the population is limited. You know, we just we just noted that trans women acquire HIV at disproportionately high rates, and as a result, they may have an increased risk of HPV-associated cancers. Um, we also mentioned that generally trans adults are less likely to access health care, including for screenings uh, for early detection of cancers. Um, the healthcare providers and guideline developers have really, we've been suboptimal uh, at being inclusive of trans and non-binary individuals. And most HPV guidance focuses on girls and women. I mean, only more recently on boys and men. Um, but if we were to shift to a, a use of a more inclusive, more gender affirming language, I think that's really essential 
to engaging these vulnerable marginalized uh, individuals who are disproportionately affected by H HPV. Yeah. So, um, so right now the only available um, HPV vaccine is the Gardasil and um, it recommended um, up to age 45 now, which is, a, which is an updated recommendation. Um, in my practice, I recommend everybody get it. I, I really, you know, the, the, from, um, and in our state, it's covered to the age of 26 um, and by most insurances. Um, from 27 to 45, um, it kind of depends on each insurance. It is, it does run from last I heard about $150 a shot. And, um, and you're in, if you're in the older cohort, you have to get three. Um, you can, um, there's some evidence that two still is effective, but um, the CDC recommendation is the three shot series. So that's quite expensive if paid out of pocket. Um, but I do recommend it to all my patients, regardless actually of their sexual activity, um, gender identity, or sexual orientation, because I feel like it's an important way to, to, um, to care for my patients in terms of preventative and primary care. Um, Dan, did you, did you want to talk a little bit more about it in terms of uh, the transgender population? And I, I actually just, yeah. I, I want to speak to it sort of more broadly, right? So if you're in an ideal circumstance, someone's being vaccinated at the earliest opportunity when their immune system can, when it can be most effective, right? So it, you know, at, around puberty, we don't necessarily know where our patients are going to end up sexual behavior wise, sexual identity wise. We, we may be, they may be starting to explore that. Um, and not everyone has identified their gender identity. Uh, some, some identify by three, but some do not. So, uh, this is a recommendation that should be genderless. It should be across the board. Anyone can get any kind, you know, it, this HPV has such an impact on so many different cancers. Uh, and it's a, it's a, it's just such an easy way to, you know, mitigate that all that we've heard from Dr. Dizan earlier about the morbidity and mortality. Uh, it just, it just seems like something that should be considered from moment one where it's, where a patient is eligible. Yeah. It's kind of the, 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 golden mecca of preventative care, right? We prevent it in the first place, right? right. That's, that's our goal is to prevent disease, not, not treat it once it's occurred, um, like Dr. Dizon has to do. So um, I think H HPV vaccine is gonna be one of the major take home points from this discussion. Um, anything else about HPV that anybody wants to, HPV vaccine that anybody wants to add? No, I, I agree with what the panel said. It should be a genderless recommendation. It's still very frustrating as someone who's seen young people die of cervical cancer, has seen the morbidity of oral head and neck cancer that is HPV associated, that we can spare our younger generations from that fate and it's not being picked up. I agree with Diane. And yeah. one more point, you know, yeah, you know, it should be genderless because gender as a social construct will change with time, you know? So it's not fixed yep. and it has to be yep. re-explored and get them early, treat them as, you know, as a, as a child and get them vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so when we're, we're talking about screening, right? We're talking, um, especially about, uh, certain organ systems. Um, we talk about anatomy. So we brought this up a couple times. Um, you know, what tissue are we screening? What tissue is present? Um, I prefer kind of open-ended discussions about anatomy, um, but I have a certain comfort level of, of discussing that with my patients. And some providers have different, you know, comfort levels talking about, um, you know, anatomy for their gender diverse or intersex patients. Um, so asking, you know, if they've had chest, a trans masculine person has had chest surgery, did they, you know, keep breast tissue, um, to be able to work with chest reconstruction? If they've had a vaginoplasty, do they have a blind pouch or do they have a, um, you know, a, a, va a vagina that would, you know, need to be considered? What did they use to make the vagina? What did they use? What tissue is involved? Um, you know, do that usually the prostate remains when we do a vaginoplasty for our trans feminine patients. Um, and when we do prostate exams, we do them through the vagina, um, unless they have a blind pouch and then we'd still be doing rectal exams um, at that point. So I think um, 
talking about anatomy is going to be important. Um, we talked about the oophorectomy, whether or not there are ovaries involved in a transmasculine patient. It ha was seemed to be standard um, to leave one ovary for a, a lot of transmasculine patients. Um, there's various reasons behind it. Um, I'm not a gynecologic surgeon, so I'm, I'm not going to um, you know, speak to that to, at any length, but um, that's a really important thing to ascertain. Um, it was the cervix removed. Do we still need to do PAPs in our transmasculine patients? Are we going to get adequate samples um, when we do PAPs because of uh, the estrogen there? Sometimes we use estrogen to, um, you know, it, vaginal estrogen for various reasons in transmasculine patients, and sometimes that will help make our PAP smears um, a little more productive. Uh, for having a hard time getting adequate cellularity, um, but also the HPV screening is really where it's at. So um, does anybody want to talk a little bit more? I know Diane has a really interesting case study that I want her to talk about in terms of um, a HPV-related um, uh, cancer that was found in the lung. Is that right, Diane? But before we go on to that, I, I did want to mention, you know, there's there's two different approaches to top surgery in folks who are assigned, who are AFAB assigned female at birth. Um, there are some surgeons that do a full mastectomy, remove lymph nodes, and uh, adapt from there. And there are most are doing what you were describing that is more of a chest reconstruction. The, and it's important to know, hopefully your patient has some sense of what, what, their, what the surgeon, what approach the surgeon takes. Um, because in one case, uh, you would need to con continue uh, screening for um, breast and chest cancers. Uh, and it gets a little more complicated, a little more difficult in that circumstance because sometimes the scar tissue can interfere with the typical screening. So you'll be using MRI instead if they've got the scar tissue there. Um, yeah. So that's just one one other thing I wanted to tag. And, and I've had a patient. I've had a patient who had just chest reconstruction, and then they did some frozen pathology, just just routinely of the breast tissue, and um, they did see ductal carcinoma. Um, Kind of yeah. after the fact, and then the patient, you know, continued to have breast tissue, and so, you know, they had their their uh, discussion, a tumor board con discussion about how are we going to move forward on screening this patient um, when there was an incidental finding of breast cancer in this transmasculine patient. Um, I do find this a fascinating conversation because I can tell you, in the world where people get diagnosed with cancer, it is not uncommon for people not to be aware of the surgery that that just went through. That's right. And, yeah. and in particular, in the case of vaginoplasties, um, not just the, 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 uh, the patient, but also the provider. I've had, you know, patients say, uh, providers say to me, you know, well, you know, think about it. If you're looking for the transition zone on the cervix, there's no transition zone uh, in a, after a vaginoplasty. There's, there's, there's no cervix there. But we can screen for HPV. And if you think about the, the cellular makeup of the graft, if it's if it's a if it's a sigmoid colon that's used for the vaginoplasty, what kind of cancer is that person going to get? It's going to be related to what we typically see on colon tissue, right? So, so I think the, the take home point that I would like to share with the partic the, the the folks who are at home watching this would be, uh, think about it on a cellular level, right? What where is the where is the risk? If it's coming from colon, if it's peritoneal, if it's a penile inversion, and I think that's a great tie into this next. Uh, before we go there, Diane, just really quickly, I would love to hear from the three of you because this is, uh, you had, Diane had mentioned that um, you had to, your EHR, your electronic health record had to have certain forms to reach meaningful use. One of them is the anatomic inventory. I've never seen it completed in the cancer clinics, never. So the question then becomes, and Dr. Eamon, your comfort levels doing this is exceptional. But what is best practice? Taylor, in your opinion, is it better that you fill it out before you see the doc or would you rather have this collaborative experience? Um, because again, this is not something that is widely done. It's a great question. I, propose. I love it. Because of my uncomfortableness with doctors, even now being open and speaking about this, I would prefer to fill it out ahead of time um, because it's so personal and it's triggering because we're talking about things that we either want to forget, we don't want to acknowledge. Um, it, it can be very sad and, you know, triggering. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can imagine that being so, especially to the level of details we just had here. You know, it's like, did they leave breast tissue? It was like, I, you know, yeah. it's so important for us to know, but at the end of the day,
we want to preserve a doctor patient relationship as best as possible. And it seems like forcing, forcing a doc who doesn't know this right. space to do this with a person who doesn't want to relive the experience may not be the best way. So perhaps a permission to, yes, let, let someone fill it out in their own time before they see you. That's okay. I always tell medical professionals that it's okay not to get everything in the first meeting. Build the trust. Let them, you know, talk openly and let them know that this is a safe space and we can take time. You know, it doesn't all have to happen in that first session. Mm -hmm. Great advice. I want to go back to this for one moment. When, when I look at this, it doesn't scream to, at me, we are doing this for our transgender patients who might be post-operative. That's not what this says to me. When I see this list, I see the cis woman who had an oophorectomy or a total hysterectomy. I, I, can, I can see how this is valuable across communities. It's not the one thing like, oh, we're doing this added thing uh, and it only really applies to one community. This has ut utility far more broadly. Um, but it does have great utility in the in the trans community. Um, just to give you this one illustration of this recently published uh, case study, uh, this is a, this is just a case of a um, a lung metastasy that that was the present presenting factor of a um, HPV related uh, cancer. Now it wasn't a cervical cancer, right? There's no cervix, there's no transition zone. This is more related to the penile skin that was utilized for the inversion. Um, so just to reinforce that point that to keep in mind the cancer risk is associated uh, with the graft and to take it one step further, you know, obviously HPV exposure exacerbates the risk. So yeah, so I think that what, what our take homes are, um, I think the USPSTF is actually starting to finally get on board. Um, I'm very proud of them. Um, for recognizing that gender is a social construct um, and that uh, screening recommendations should be based on specific factors that, that may not um, be gender identity specific, right? So, um, so I love this statement that the USPSTF made, um, which I, you know, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, but they do intend to be inclusive. Um, they do intend to use gender neutral language um, and they tend to, they want to address specific anatomy um, as opposed to uh, specific aspects of gender identity. So I think, um, I think we're moving forward. I think hopefully we'll have more inclusive recommendations. I don't think we're gonna have a separate sideline like these are recommendations for your cis patients and these are recommendations for your trans patients, but more like these are the recommendations for patients who still have a cervix, right? Um, as opposed to now where it's like, you know, pap smears in women, which is really what, what the recommendations say. So I think we're kind of broadening our language to be more inclusive um, for our kind of gender diverse patients. And I think, um, you know, I see a lot of adolescents uh, and young adults and a lot of my patients uh, identify as non-binary, gender fluid, or gender diverse um, with they, them, um, or uh, non-binary pronouns. And I think that we're going to start seeing a lot of um, the next generation kind of moving into um, a, almost like a, a you know a non-binary, maybe even being one of the more predominant gender markers. Um, so we really do need to talk about anatomy and, and meet our patients where they're at. Um, for Can I just... Just, I want to give Taylor just some optimism that hopefully I will never meet you in the oncology clinic space. But that <laughs> same process is happening in oncology where we're actually actively trying to decouple gender from cancer for a very yeah. long time, up until several years ago. And, you know, to get onto a clinical trial with breast cancer, it was literally language women with breast cancer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or men, males with prostate cancer. Right, or, or men with testicular cancer, and yeah. Men so and we're we now see women with to testicular say, cancer, and yeah. yeah. Exactly, and it was curious. Historically, this was literally led by men with breast cancer who right. were excluded from those trials. And when you see it in that light, you see how restrictive it is when you couple gender 
and cancer. So we are trying to do exactly the same thing that is being you know, advised by the USPSTF. So and among the um, best practices and promising practices for comprehensive cancer screening and prevention is, is to do exactly this, to center on the relevant anatomy and the high risk behaviors right. specifically um, right. and leave it there. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And be and be welcoming and be a place where people can disclose that information so that you can appropriately screen it. So um, and that was the end of the first half of the talk where, you know, we people aren't going to tell you about their high risk behavior if they don't feel comfortable in your office and they, they don't feel like they can and they don't feel like it's safe. So. No, I think this is, you know, we use a term in, in medicine and certainly it's something that comes up in oncology, this term of cultural competence, which I was on a call and it was really that implies that if you take a test and you pass, you're good. Right. <laughs> what we're, right. we are, what we are talk, yeah. yeah, we're talking about being culturally hum humble to ask that question. How do you want me to address you? What are the things you need me to do with you? Are things that the trans community wants to teach people in medicine because they don't want to be treated like other? we have to be accepting to learn that. And I think this is really the point of having us all up here. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to everybody on the panel and thanks to PVI for um, making this happen. Um, I think that there's an opportunity for a lot more discussion on transgender health, um, HIV in the trans community, a lot of other topics we just lightly touched on in this discussion that could use some fleshing out. So maybe we'll be seeing some of those in the future. It was a pleasure to stare, share the stage with all of you. All right, ditto. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash YDT 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Merck and Company Incorporated. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.